Welcome back after a short break. Uh, I will start today by discussing the second part of the mid semester question paper in which we took up a live problem from Second World War. I am sure it must have aroused some curiosity in your mind about what this is and you know is it real and also how real is it. So I thought I will share with you. This is actually um, an instance which happened in the Second World War. So the first answer is it is a real problem, it is a live problem. This actually happened. But I have modified few things, I have twisted some things to fit into the question paper format. So uh, during the Second World War, there were two basic uh, fighting associations you can say, allies. One was the ally between UK, Canada, USA, the other one was the Germans. And both of them wanted to create a situation so that the other enemy cannot sustain the war for a long time. So to do that, they were both interested in creating long term damage to the ability to sustain the war. So <clears throat> the allied forces realized that there are these three dams in the rural valley of Germany and if the dams are breached, the water will flood the complete industrial complex which was producing armament, which was producing hydroelectric power as well as uh, so many other industries. So both sides were planning to bomb the dams of each other. It's not just one side. Both of them were planning. <coughs> now, how do you how do you dam how do you damage a dam? A dam is a very very massive structure, and it's a very heavy structure. So one way is that you fly an aircraft with a very heavy powerful bomb exactly over the dam, and with the precise operation, you drop the ammunition on the bomb uh, on the dam and then you can expect it to be breached. But it is very difficult. Uh, during those days there was no GPS, there was no navigational aid available. So to fly into the territory of the enemy close to around 715 kilometers and then to drop exactly over the dam an armament was very difficult. And secondly, the calculations showed that the amount of ammunition you need to drop would be more than 10,000 pounds and there was no aircraft available which can carry 10,000 pounds at that time. So blasting the bombs using a direct, uh, blasting the dam using direct bomb was impossible. What is the other option? So why don't you think, what is the other option you would do? Hmm? Okay, so kamikaze, that means you just take an aircraft and do a suicide mission. Okay, so there again, <clears throat> they did not think of that particular uh, option. They said, we let us look of some other way. So one option was every dam has a big lake in front of it which is the catchment area, the reservoir. Why not fire torpedoes inside the reservoir which would go and hit the dam wall. Germans realized it, so they put torpedo barriers, nets. A few meters ahead of the net, there were net barriers. So if a torpedo is hit, it will get entangled in the barrier. And the Allied knew it by their intelligence that we cannot bomb it with torpedoes. So a lot of studies were done in the UK on what kind of bombs can be designed to. So many people gave proposals. Some of them were very crazy proposals. And many of them were ignored. So one aeronautical engineer called uh, Barnes Wallace. He's a very established aircraft designer and he has designed many aircraft also. He also designed a very good airship called RH 101. So <clears throat> he came up with an idea and he suggested a proposal to the Allied uh, High Command saying uh, uh, some a suggestion to bomb the dams. And it was considered ridiculous, stupid, and not considered. But he persisted, he persisted. And then he told the um, uh, in charge, why don't you allow me to do some experiments and show it to you. So he did some experiments. So he went to his children and he said, when you throw marbles on water, sometimes they skip on the water. So his idea was, can we have a bomb which can be released, which can keep bouncing and it will bounce and hit the dam wall and then somehow go down and explode. So he did some experiments with his children at his home and then his swimming pool. He took marbles, threw them. He discovered that if you drop the marbles at an angle 7 degrees or below from the horizontal, you know, at 7 degree angle or less, only then the marbles were skipping. 
any angle more than that the marble goes inside. So this is the first discovery he made. Then he got some funding and then they were recording videos. So what he did is he made spherical bomb and various kinds of surfaces, dimples, rub, serrations, shiny, all kinds of surfaces were tried. Finally they said we will put a wooden casing around this spherical ball and we will drop this spherical ball on a lake and allow it to skip and they were recording the video of that. So what they discovered is that as soon as this bomb falls on the lake, the casing disintegrates and the bomb goes inside. In one such experiment, the casing disintegrated but the bomb fell out and began skipping. Okay. And then in one experiment, uh, they found that a cylindrical shaped body works better than a spherical body. Okay. All this is recorded. Now parallelly, they built small dams, temporarily, you know, uh, artificial dams. They were trying to bomb it by putting charges of various capacity. And they found that if the charge is put in the water near the dam, nothing happens. Whatever charge you put, it is not damaging. Because the blast wave of the explosive is repelled by the water. The water is 1000 times more dense than air. In one experiment, whether by mistake or whatever, the small charge was stuck to the wall of the dam. And they found that even a small charge is able to explode the dam. Provided it is touching the dam wall. So now there is another requirement. We need a bomb which can be taken 700 kilometers away, which can be dropped, it should skip, it should hit the dam wall and then sink down and touch the dam wall. It should skip over torpedo nets and touch the dam wall and sink below. Sorry, sink and then touch the dam and then explode. Now how to do it? So for that, uh, this chap, Sir Barnes Wallace, he basically decided, uh, designed this particular uh, bomb. It is called as, <coughs> there is a name given to this, um, it is called as upkeep. Okay. So now I will just show you a small poster from the Royal Air Force about this operation. So here is a bouncing bomb. Okay. So the idea uh, is that if you have a spinning cylinder, now you can spin it forward, you can spin it backward. If you spin it forward, what will happen as you throw it, it will jump over the dam wall. This is useless. But if it spins backwards, then when it touches the dam wall, the back spin is going to drag it below. Okay. So <clears throat> they made lots of uh, attempts and then uh, this chart is familiar to you because you have used it in the examination. So the actual route that was followed by them, I will try to show you. This is the actual route which was followed by them. Right. So the <coughs> RAF Campton, but I gave you this path for onward journey and this for return journey. Actually, there were three waves. There were three groups of aircraft which were sent. So the first and the third were sent along your return route and the second was sent along your onward route. That is the one change I made in the uh, calculations. And then there were three dams. There was a Eder, Mone and Sorpe. But we took only at the Mone Dam in our examination. Now, RS Camptum is actually a Royal Air Force base and a new squadron called 617 was actually formed. And But the bomb was a secret. It was not um, declared. It was being designed. Now, the requirement is, now during the testing they have found that there are some conditions under which this system works. Number one, you have to be 60 feet above the ground, above the water. Number two, your speed should be only around 220 miles per hour. Number three, you should drop the bomb at around 460 feet from the dam wall. If all these three things are done and the bomb is spinning at a 500 RPM backwards, then the chances of this bomb skipping three or four times and hitting the wall and sinking and in the bomb they put a, what is called as a pressure pressure fuse. That means with the dynamic pressure or with the pressure, hydrostatic pressure of the water, when it exceeds some uh, depth, it will explode. So that means you need to have aircraft uh, which can carry this bomb. 
and you need to have pilots who are skilled to apply to fly at this condition. So this new squadron was taken by volunteers from everywhere including from Canada and from USA and they were told there is some secret mission, do not talk about it, just learn practice to fly 100 feet above the ground and during night time. So for many weeks they were just flying all over England 100 feet above the ground mostly at night. They had no idea what the bomb is going to be used for. Now the day was chosen as 16th of May 1943 because during that time the water was completely full in the reservoir. So in the midnight of 16th and 17th of May this particular raid was launched. 19 aircraft were dispatched in three groups. Why so many aircraft? Because you do not know how many will reach, you do not know how many will actually be able to do this mission and there are three dams to be destroyed. Now the route was taken based on assessment of where you will find the minimum artillery on the ground but it proved to be a wrong information. In fact there were many people who were lost because of the ground fire. Some were lost in the return journey also, some were lost in the onward journey also. So what happened in real life is that 19 aircraft were launched on only 11 came back. So 8 of them were lost. Each aircraft as you know has 7 people. Why so many people? Because the warfare at that time was basically aircraft to aircraft. So when you are flying in the enemy territory, there will be aircraft chasing you. Now how do you decide or how do you tell the pilot what is the height is 60 feet? Today you will say you have a radio altimeter but it is not there at that time. And pressure altimeters which are used for altitude are not so accurate that they can give you 60 feet reading. So they did a very innovative system of two lights. So there were two lights which were mounted on the aircraft in the bomb bay at a particular angle such that the beams will coincide and the height is 60 feet. So there was one observer who would simply say up, up, down, down, up, up till the beams are matching. There will be one person who will be looking at the speed and there will be one person who will be looking at the orientation. That is why I told you six passes are needed. Okay. In fact, in the real situation, the ninth pass was successful for one aircraft. So imagine eight times they are circling and trying to come at 60 feet, 460 meters and uh, sorry, 460 feet, 60 feet and 220 whatever speed. They did it nine times. Ninth time they were able to do it. Of course, if you read the whole story, it is a very interesting story. You will find that three bombs were dropped, three bombs hit the dam but only one could actually damage it. Other two were, one was dropped short, one was bouncing over, okay. And then <coughs> the other dams also, one dam was, there were three bombs which hit the dam but none of them, only one small dent was created. The bomb, the, the, the dam was intact. And the third dam was to be bombed by a normal vertical flight. The Germans had kept it completely unattended because they never expected anything to come that side. There was very difficult flight terrain to come there. So they said there is no one to attack you. Keep on trying, keep on trying, keep on trying. And after some nth trial, they were able to attain the height and do it. Now, <coughs> this is the this is the bomb mounted below the Lancaster aircraft. You can see this is the aircraft. This is the bomb bay. The bomb bay was modified and they put a chain kind of a system with this cylindrical bomb. Okay. And uh, <coughs> yeah, this I have already shown you. So you can see uh, this is the requirement. You fly at this particular speed with these spotlights and you have the bomb which goes here. When because it is spinning backwards, it touches the wall and comes down. There is a lateral force created. This is because of Quanda effect. And then the bomb goes below. See, they have put the trapeze, the nets can be skipped. Okay. And this kind of a very simple bomb site was created so that there are two pillars at the dam. When these two pillars meet, so with a simple caliper like this, they were flying in the bomb and saying, okay, 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 forward, forward, slow, fast, whatever. Right? And you can see the waves. The so first wave has so many aircraft, second wave, third. So 19 Lancaster aircraft were sent. 8 were lost, 3 turned back, okay. 53 people were killed, 3 were taken prisoner. Mohane and Eder dams were breached, Zorpe dam was only damaged, nothing happened to it, they could quickly support it. 
and you can see uh, this is one sketch of the damage to the to the Mohane Dam. So ultimately, the uh, damage, of course, the, the 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 Germans were able to repair the dam and bring it back to power, but it was only basically a great morale boost that we have been able to breach the dams. So that particular um, that particular uh, operation gave a lot of enthusiasm to the allied forces. Okay. So you can go and have a look at this particular website which talks about, I will upload this on the web page. And here is the aircraft, the Lancaster aircraft, modified Lancaster aircraft and uh, what else. And I will upload a video, I upload a document containing so many documentaries which are there available online. One interesting thing uh, which I would like to share with you is a recent attempt to recreate the bouncing bomb by this professor from Cambridge University. So <clears throat> what he did is he says let us try again to see and there is a beautiful, so they built a small dam like this, a concrete dam in Canada and this particular uh, dam was uh, bombed with the help of a civil aircraft which was flying at that time. So they rented an aircraft and they used it to recreate and try out. So this is also very, this is the professor with his student, okay. And there is a very beautiful documentary, BBC documentary on dam busters building the bouncing bomb. They won an award for the Royal Television Best History Program in 2011. Okay, so with that I think we come back to more mundane matters about uh, now, all of you have uh, an aircraft assigned to you, correct? Anybody here with no aircraft assigned? All of you have an aircraft assigned to you and you have to now start getting very intimate with your aircraft. You need to know its data, its geometry, its history, background, purpose, aim, mission, everything you have to keep searching. It is not very easy. You will not get enough data from only one source or one Wikipedia or one website. You have to now just search everywhere which is the best source for information about aircraft? What do you think? Which, which book or document is the best source of data? Do you have no idea? Yes, aircraft handbook, which aircraft handbook? Of that aircraft? Yeah. Oh, that is not available for all aircraft. That is very, 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 if you are lucky you will get it online or somewhere. Maybe you got it for your aircraft, so you are lucky, okay. Other people, what would you, what would be the most reliable and most exhaustive source of data for your assignment? There is a document or there is a book called as Jane's All the World's Aircraft, do you know about it? Okay, there is a document which is published every year. Jane's All the World's Aircraft, our library, main library has some copies. But we do not buy it every year, it is very expensive and our department library also has a copy of one issue, I think 2006 or whatever issue and I think in Cassidy also we purchased one uh, copy of Jane's few years ago, 2002 or 3, okay. I also happen to have a soft copy of Jane's All the World Aircraft of one particular edition but it is very large in size because it is a scanned image. So there are 2000 pages which have been scanned into one document. So I will not be able to share it but I can pass it on to the teaching assistant and you can take it from him if you want. Very difficult to search because it is only images so you will have to really go through the whole thing to locate your aircraft. You cannot do your control F and find your aircraft. But I would recommend all of you should go to either the main library or the departmental library or the CASD and look for this document and I am pretty sure that most of you will find your aircraft in that along with photographs. 3U diagram, dimensions, weights, whatever is asked, all that will be available there. But be careful, there are many models of the same aircraft. So you have to give a specific model, you have to get data for that model, okay. So that is my recommendation to you. Uh, go and refer to James All the World Aircraft and contact your TA uh, for uh, a soft copy of one of the editions. So that is the best source of information and most authentic source of information, okay. So assuming that you have your aircraft in front of you and you have its geometrical data in front of you, 
let us say you want to now estimate its drag coefficient because you want to estimate what drag will be created in this aircraft when it flies at various mission segments with various kinds of configurations without bombs, with bombs or in case of passenger aircraft you might have some uh, requirements. Okay. So today we will look at only the subsonic parasite drag estimation. We will not look at transonic flight, supersonic flight and we will not look at induced drag. We will look only at parasite drag and that too subsonic flight. Now for what class of aircraft is this particular thing most applicable? Which aircraft type? So one is subsonic, yes, and transports mostly. So the, uh, now how many of you have transport aircraft assigned to you? Raise your hand, only one, two, three, civil and transport is the same thing, yeah. Or military cargo is also a transport aircraft actually speaking, okay. Now how many of your aircraft are subsonic? Most of you are subsonic only. So for you this particular um, presentation will contain almost everything that you need to do the drag estimation. Others will have to wait till the next class when we look at additional elements for supersonic aircraft and military aircraft. Okay. So <coughs> a very, very brief look at past uh, basic aerodynamics. Drag can be consisting of two components mostly. You can consider it to be uh, parasite drag and induced drag. I have blocked induced drag because we will not consider it today. Okay. So, but what is induced drag? Let us just get an idea from you. What is induced drag? Raise your hand so that I can ask a specific person. And please speak loudly because we are recording it. Okay. Yes, what is induced drag? Traditional drag that an aircraft uh, happens when it has a particular shear. Okay, so can we say it is lift dependent drag? It is only there when the aircraft is generating some lift. So when CL is 0, there is no induced drag. What about if CL is negative? You have the same induced drag because you have CL square by pi AE. Okay. So whether CL is positive or negative, you will still have induced drag. However, if the CL is 0, non-lifting body, then you do not have induced drag. So we call it as also a lift dependent drag and everything else is lift independent or parasite. Now a parasite drag, if you look only, yes. Sir, are we talking about the drag of wing or the drag on the whole aircraft? Aircraft. We are talking about the aircraft now. So <clears throat> if you look at parasite drag, again there are many types, but if you limit to only subsonic, which is what we will do today, then it is basically only consisting of what is called as profile drag and that will consist of three or four factors. One would be skin friction, the other would be form or pressure, these are interchangeable words. Then there is interference drag and then there is others. In others we will look at miscellaneous and one component called as leakage and protuberance. Now please understand this is not a class in aerodynamics, this is a class in aircraft design. So we look at drag, the same physical phenomena in a little bit different manner. In the sense, the physics is the same, but our job, what is our job in aircraft design? Estimation. So we have entered now the phase of the capsule in which we are going to do estimation. We are not too much concerned right now about modeling or analysis or physics. Our concern is given an aircraft in front of me about whom I have the geometrical data or a concept which I have to investigate, how can I quickly estimate the induced, uh, the profile, the, the <coughs> parasite drag. So because of that, we will make some assumptions, we will make some approximations, we will use some thumb rules, but if you are careful about where to use, where not to use, you will not be too much wrong. Okay? So look at it from that point of view, we are interested in estimation given the geometry. Now, as against this, what would an aerodynamicist do? Suppose you are an aerodynamicist and you have been given this aircraft. What aircraft is given to you? 
F117 or Nighthawk. Okay, so Nighthawk is the aircraft. Now he has to calculate the CD of Nighthawk, and he is a hardcore aerodynamicist. What would he do? What would you do? No, I am not talking about anybody. I want to only calculate CD. Uh, and then calculate the wetted area. Okay, then. How do you do it? Tell me how will you do. What method would you follow? How many of you are really interested in aerodynamics? Just raise your hands. Okay, passionate about aerodynamics. Okay, so what would you do? Okay, so you will calculate Reynolds number. Good. Then. Okay, so you will look at whether the flow is separated or not, and where it separates. Then. Okay, so this is, but this is not an aerodynamicist approach. Saying that I will assume it to be flat plate, you are coming into my domain. That is a designer methodology. The, what will the aerodynamicist do? What would you do? You will do CFD. Hmm? So, in CFD, what do you have to do? First, you make a mesh. To make a mesh, what do you need? Complete geometry. So, either you will first make a CAD model or any other 3D model, maybe using some software. Then you will build a mesh around it. Then you will put boundary conditions. Then you will decide the solver. You will put the appropriate turbulence model. And then you will do the CFD run analysis. Okay. And then what else? Is that okay? Or will you do some validation first? Assuming that you already have confidence in your tool, you have done some part. You will do CFD analysis. This is what most people would do today, those who are experts or interested in aerodynamics. There is one more approach, wind tunnel testing. So you will say geometry of black nighthawk is known to me. I will make a wind tunnel model. Take it to a wind tunnel, put a balance, tune the balance, measure the forces and the moments. And with that, calculate the aerodynamic coefficients. We have two approaches. Now, when you do aircraft design, especially conceptual design, can I expect you to do this work? It is very time consuming. And moreover, it is an overkill because you have not finalized the aircraft. When you are designing the aircraft, you have to estimate maybe hundreds of such configurations, if not thousand. So, every time you will do CAD analysis, it is too much. So, in big corporations, in big organizations, people do it because there are dedicated to a team of 50 CFD people. Okay, every day when they come in the morning, they get a new geometry. So they say, okay, let us do this, mesh it, and all that, whatever. They, they do so many things. Okay, and then when they do a very detailed analysis, each run may take two days. So we are not in that stage. We are in conceptual design stage. We don't have the luxury of building hundred models or doing hundred CFD runs. We are here for estimation, quick estimate. But you cannot say, okay, uh, transport aircraft CD not equal to 0 0.02 Lelo. That is too much. That is just a very, very basic number. At least you want to relate it to the geometry, to the size, to the shape, to the aerofoil, something, isn't it? So there has to be a midway path. So understand, we are interested in estimate. So for our convenience, we have divided the Profile drag into skin friction, form, interference, and others. In others, we have miscellaneous, which is all kinds of nonsensical components that you can think of, small, 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 small things. And we have one component called as leakage input. We will see what all of them mean. We will take them one by one. So, <clears throat> when you start, you start with two basic approaches. The first approach is very simplistic approach, equivalent skin friction, about which he was trying to speak. What is that approach? It is very strange. You replace the aircraft with an equivalent flat plate. It is as simple as that. Okay. Here is an aircraft with wing, fuselage, tail, nacelle, blah, 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 engines, bombs. We say forget it. This aircraft is equal to this flat plate of so much area. And we say for flat plate, I have a mastery. I know what is the flat plate skin friction coefficient, etc., etc. So I can calculate. It's like equivalent equivalent SFC also, which you use in the examination. So it's cheating basically. You are 
you are not having a turbo fan aircraft you have a turbo prop aircraft but you say make it a equivalent turbo fan so that my formula which are easy can be used similarly here what you say is aircraft is very complicated it's very large it has got all these components and i am in a beginning stage forget it i'll replace it with an equivalent flat plate and just estimate on the right side we have component built up method that is little bit more sophisticated little bit more that we say hey don't do this don't take aircraft equal to flat plate what you do is oh there is an aircraft it has got some components what are the components of an aircraft of a typical aircraft fuselage wing horizontal tail vertical tail then engines or the nacelle engine is inside so it's a nacelle okay then what else that's it maybe a drop tank maybe a bomb maybe a missile those are only for military aircraft in generally what do you have fuel large wing tail htvt and nacelles so these are called components of the aircraft i don't mean need nuts rivets bolts and all that component means these major assembly so we say okay let us calculate the drag of each component and then sum it together so instead of saying aircraft equal to flat plate we can say fuse large equal to cylinder wing equal to flat plate ht equal to flat plate nacelle equal to cylinder or cylinder with cone little bit sophistication but still simplistic enough for you to be able to do by hand or by a simple computer program in your conceptual design obviously component built up will be more accurate than equivalent shin friction okay but it's not that it will be too far better it will still be an approximation so let's see one by one for the simplification so we say that parasite drag d parasite it's a sum of two components skin friction and pressure skin friction drag and pressure drag okay it's a very simplistic assumption there are other terms which we will say forget about it right now we will put them somewhere else now which of this is more prominent in a typical subsonic transport aircraft is it skin friction or is it Uh, is it uh, uh, pressure why is that so so what is what is the reason of skin friction drag why do we have skin friction drag correct because as the fluid flows past the aircraft it encounter resistance because of skin friction and what is the cause of pressure drag no when you say flow separate so that means if the flow is not separated there is no pressure drag there is so it is still there okay pressure drag is because of the shape okay because presence of the body is going to deviate the air it's not about rubbing it's about now changing its path so the more you have the frontal area or the form the more you make the air turn the more there will be resistance so a blunt body will have more pressure drag compared to a smooth streamlined body and if you have a body where the flow is separated god help you then there will be very high pressure drag so we assume that aerodynamics or the designers are not so stupid that they will make a very badly shaped aircraft okay so what would be the tough uh, typical proportion between skin friction and pressure drag for a well designed aircraft we does not have too much separated flow not more than 3 is to 1 1 is to 10 10% okay so what we say we say 90% of that is skin friction and 10% is pressure for a well designed aircraft in subsonic flow so what we do is we say forget about pressure drag calculation we will put a factor we will put some factor 10% additional okay this is a way in which a designer approximates and they are not wrong this is all based on experience this is what you have to learn this is what you have to acquire okay this is all gyan you just take it because it has come from people who have done the work okay you can say no i will do full cfd karo you do it and then you will find how oh, yeah yeah he was right you know it is 9.8% not 10% okay you are more accurate than me but you will find it will be a well designed aircraft will have only around 10% pressure drag so we say forget it no calculation we will incorporate that by a factor and we will focus on skin friction drag 
Now, skin friction drag is basically because of skin friction. So, we will say replace the aircraft with a flat plate and the skin friction on the flat plate which is equivalent to the aircraft that we can calculate by simple formula. So, we will use what is called as a equivalent skin friction coefficient CFE for the aircraft. No components here, it is for aircraft. And we can say CDO which is the term for parasite drag coefficient is equal to some skin friction coefficient into wetted area upon reference area. Now, this ratio S wet by S ref, how do you get this ratio? Can you do it for your aircraft? It is possible. You can be as accurate as you want to be. Somebody will say, I have the complete data of F117 or whatever aircraft. I will make a detailed CAD model and that model will give me the wetted area. Okay. And reference area is very simple, na? project it in the top view and take it including, as I told you, extending the cord towards the center line. Okay. So, somebody might say, no, this is too much for such a simple thing. So, we can do simplification. We can say, okay, aircraft has all these components. So, you can replace the center of fuse lag by a cylinder with some two conical things. You can replace wing by a trapezoidal flat plate forget the effect of aerofoil. Actually speaking, aerofoil will have some curvature, so it will give you more than just the present. So, you can make some simple uh, simplification and do it. Aircraft, everything is aircraft right now. Yes, yes. The reference area is for the wing. See, by definition, the aircraft reference area is wing reference area. That is the definition. So, SRF will remain only wing platform area. SRF will be the aircraft vetted area. So, S1 by S1, you can just calculate from geometry with whatever sophistication you want and multiply it by a factor which is CFE. So, that factor replaces the aircraft with a flat plate. Now, how much will that factor be? For that, you go into historical data and interestingly, for different aircraft types, there are different factors given. Life is very easy here. Your aircraft, what category does it belong to? fighter. So, there is Air Force fighter 35. So, if he calculates CD naught by this method, he will say 35 into 10 power minus 4 into S wet by S ref. Okay, what is that have given to you? Military cargo. So, what will you use? You will use 30 because it is bomber and transport. It will come in that category, bomber and transport. Oh, 35, sorry, 35 military cargo. Uh, because it is, instead of writing 0 0.0025, I am writing 25 into 10 power minus 4. Just ease. The number is 0 0.0030 or 0 0.0040. I am just writing 40 and then 10 power minus uh, 4 on the top. Okay. It's a coefficient. It's a coefficient. <coughs> it's a coefficient. So, an aircraft may have S by S F equal to 5. So, it will be 5 into 0 0.0030 that will become the CDO. Very simple, very easy, but not very, not very, very accurate. However, it gives you a good number to start your calculations. This is, you can agree, very quick, not very time consuming. You can do it for your aircraft, okay. So, all of you will do it for your aircraft. This very simple thing. If your aircraft is not listed in this, you have to take a guess. It is somewhat here or I will assume it to be this type with some justification. Okay, now those who are not happy will go lightly further. Okay. We will say oh, no, this is not okay. This in this every aircraft, every military aircraft will have the same. No, no, if the S1 by SF is same and both are bombers, it will have same drag in this method. Yes. Uh, yes. what is the difference between a, like isn't the Air Force fighter already a high speed aircraft present? Well see these this information has come by and the author who has done this work for various aircraft types and then he figures out and says, okay, typically air force fighters have, now your question is, when you say high speed aircraft, it actually does not mean, it means Mach number 0 0.9 and all those, beyond 0 0.9 or beyond 1, that is high speed aircraft. Okay. So, you pick up, now the, what is the point here, see, 
Uh, F was 5 to the 35, Navy fighter is 40. So what is, the, what is the big logic here? What happens if you work for Navy? You have arrested hook on the bottom, okay. Then you may have some other devices for, uh, you will have larger flap deflections because you are operating from short uh, ships. So there will be some other components which will create more drag. So if the aircraft is designed for Navy with the same effort by SRF compared to land, there will be some more, that is what is being captured here by these numbers. It is a very approximate one. So this is very simple. Now let us take the one step further. One step further will be component by component. So there what we do is, we say the total drag, okay, in this the CDA will come later. First you do D and then CD. The total drag of an aircraft is summation of drag of, now this is not drag but only the parasite drag, okay. So the total parasite drag of the aircraft is equal to summation of the parasite drag of each component, wing, fuselage, tail, landing, uh, not landing here, wing, fuselage, tail, nacelle, etc. Plus drag because of leakages and protuberances, which I will discuss what it is, plus drag of other items, miscellaneous items, which also we will discuss. So here we go a little bit more component wise. So now how do you calculate the parasite drag of each component? So for that <coughs> we say take any component, the parasite drag will consist of <coughs> skin friction drag, form drag and interference drag. So, so what is meant by interference drag and why does it come? Presence of a component like an engine near a component like wing will affect the flow field around that component. So the wing will affect the flow field around the engine and vice versa the engine will affect the flow field around the wing. So if you can do a very careful aerodynamic integration, you will minimize the interference but you cannot make it zero. The only way, how do you make it zero? What is it? By having blended. So you blend the, but even with blending you will only reduce, maybe you reduce 95 percent but you will still have 5 percent. Do something so that the flow field does not get affected. What is the way? Keep it far away. Take it so far away that there is no interference, right? So <clears throat> let us say you have an engine. You mount the engine on the fuselage side, there will be high, induced, high interference drag. You put a small link and take it away, there will be less drag. It is shown and you will see that later. If you make it, if you take it one diameter or more away, the interference hardly is present. So you can assume no interference drag. As long as the body is within one diameter near the big body, it creates interference. So the best way is keep it away, that is what people do. To avoid interference drag, they put a boom and they put the engine on the boom. So you take it little bit far away and you will notice if you look carefully from now on, the distance away will be slightly more than the diameter of the body which is attached. because studies have shown that one diameter distance is sufficient to kill all the interference effects, <laughs> okay. But that has weight problem and cost problem and there will be additional drag because of the plank of the body. But you may use it to put fuel inside or some armament or something. So it is a trade off. You keep on doing these things till you say we have come to the conclusion that this is the best configuration, okay. So what we will do now is, now instead of looking, replacing the aircraft with a flat plate, we will replace each component by standard components and calculate the value. So <clears throat> the skin friction drag will be the equivalent skin friction coefficient of that component into S weight by SRF of that component. You use this for every component, then you also incorporate the effect of form and the effect of interference and get the summation. So <coughs> form drag as I said is only a factor, 
So for that there is a term called as a form factor. This form factor is a function of the shape of the body and its geometrical dimensions. So for every body, I will show you how to calculate, for every body, for every component of the aircraft, you can calculate the form factor. And then if it is 1.03, that means 3 percent additional drag because of pressure. If it is 1.05, it means 5 percent additional drag because it is a multiplicative factor. The, the profile drag is going to be in the, the parasite drag into form factor. That will be parasite drag plus form drag into Q which will be the interference factor that will be the. So you, you take effect, you, you take care of these additive terms by a multiplicative term by factors. So F, so interference factor is Q into DSF. So if I multiply Q into FF into DSF, I will get the total parasite drag of the component. I sum all of them for each component, I get total parasite drag of each component. Right? And then I add the two terms because of LMP and miscellaneous. Now miscellaneous is miscellaneous. I cannot even give you the full list. Things like flaps, landing gear and then there are two important terms. One is upswept aft fuselage in some aircraft and how many of you have military cargo? So have you looked at the rear of your aircraft fuselage? How is it? Does it have suddenly taper on the back on the bottom fuselage or is it conventional? So you are lucky, you will not have this drag. There will be some aircraft. Is there any aircraft in the class which has got a sudden change in the rear sweep of the fuselage? Which one do you have? What is the aircraft? Yes, it will have, it will have. So why does it have like that? The top is almost straight and the bottom is straight and then suddenly there is an upward cut. Why do we have it? Because there is a there is a back door which opens like this. Correct. So, from the point of view of function, we need a back door which is like that. You cannot go away without it. Okay. So, for that, they have given conventional thing on the top and the bottom there is a sudden thing. Now, this is going to be beneficial from the point of view of usability, but unfortunately, it is going to create some additional drag which is because of the fuselage upsweep. So he will have to take this term. You may not have to take the term if your figure is not like that. I will tell you why and I will tell you how to do it. Then there is something called a fuselage base area. Okay. Now a fuselage is basically an aerodynamic body. It is actually a body of revolution in most cases, in most cases, correct? So in the end on the rear, is it closed or does it have any rectangular or circular thing at the end? So, all of you should now tell me about your aircraft. What do you think? Do you have a fuselage which is closed in the end or it has got some big rectangular or some other cross-sectional in the, in the back? So, let us say Lancaster aircraft. What does it have on the back? What is it? No, every aircraft has a closed end, but is it flattish? What is there on the Lancaster rear? You can see the no, I showed you the picture and in the examination also I asked you a question. I uh, will show you that uh, aircraft once again. Is it closed? It is not closed, right? There is a machine gunner sitting there with how many? With four machine guns. Okay, the rear, we forgot there are eight machine guns, right? So, uh, two in the front, two in the center and then there was this guy, you can see there is a window here, it is not very clear. Can we just have the light off please? There is, a, there is a window here and there is a gentleman sitting here with four machine guns, two on the left, two on the right, which thousand rounds each. So, this particular thing is not a, so this has got a base area. If you look from this side, you will not see a point, you will see a big thing in the rear view that is called as a base area. So this is very bad for drag. Why is it bad for drag? There is a low pressure area behind. So when the air comes from the top, it finds a low pressure area, there will be lots of turbulence at the back that creates drag. So if you have these kind of features in the aircraft, like if you have 
if you have uh, either a base area. Now, every aircraft has a, has a base area, but some is very small. So, what do you have at the, at the rear end of most of the aircraft? Let us say transport aircraft. What do you have? You have an APU. Where is an APU? Anybody else can answer what is an APU? Auxiliary power unit. What is it used for? It can be used for starting the engine, it can be used for powering the air conditioner and pressurization system when the aircraft is on the ground. Not every aircraft have it. It is a small engine mounted on the extreme tip of the fuselage, at the extreme end of the fuselage. If you ever take a flight next time on any transport aircraft that you see, okay, except ATR 72 and 42 because they do not have an APU. They use the right engine as an APU, which is very expensive, but they say it saves money in maintenance cost and the APU cost. But for big aircraft, it is very expensive to run the engine on the ground just to power the passengers and conduct. So, they have an APU, it is a small engine. So, because it is uh, an APU, they have a taper there, so it is almost no base area, almost no base area, very small. You may even neglect it or if you are very particular, you just see how much it is. It, it, it will be a small area and you can consider it. So, if you have uh, things like uh, a landing gear now, uh, in, in Lancaster very interestingly, the main landing gear was going inside, but the tail landing gear was fixed. The reason is there was no place to take it inside because there was a man sitting there with the machine gun. So, they said, let us fly the aircraft with landing gear permanently exposed at the tail but main landing gear goes inside because keeping it will be very difficult, very bad for drag. So, if you have landing gear which is fixed or if you have fuselage base area or a sweep, you will have additional drag terms. Yes. What about uh, fighter aircraft that have their engines inside the uh, fuselage? At yes. the end of the fuselage, the fighter aircraft's cross section is open. Yes, yes, yes. It is a problem. It is a problem. That is a base area. Very good. But it should be uh, more uh, pronounced than uh, in the case of Lancaster because the hot air coming out and the very low pressure. Correct. But hot air coming out may actually be better than having nothing there because that will suck the air and take it with it, no? induction. So, drag may reduce. If you have an exhaust at the trailing edge, the creation of high jet may create a low pressure zone which will suck the air from the top. So, drag will be low. In this case, there is nothing to suck the air, it is a flat thing on the back. So, separation will be enhanced. So, there will be more base drag. But you are right. Um, so, what I would say is in a military aircraft, if you have engine on the back, you ignore this because it is taken care. It is taken care. That may be one reason why people put exhaust on the back. That is another good thing to put exhaust on the back. And then lastly, we have two terms, uh, leakages and protuberances. So, protuberances are very simple. That is a simple word. It means anything projecting out. So, from a typical aircraft, what is projecting out? It or static tube is one thing. Okay. Now, nowadays, there are some aircraft with flush, okay. but in most aircraft, it is jetting out. What else? Antennae. So many of them. Anything else? Hmm? No, that is not desired. <laughs> Reverse will be there because of bad manufacturing or because of uh, in-service, but it is not supposed to be and they would be taken care in the uh, check D. They will make it smooth. Something which is required to be there by function. Antenna is one. Pitot's hurry tube is one. What else? Lights. lights. Very good. Anything else? You might shape the lights little bit to make it less draggy, but they will be there. They will be there. Armament? But armament is disposable. And uh, do you know of any mechanism to reduce the drag of exposed armaments? It is called as internal carriage. So, F 35 for example, it carries armament inside because the requirement for the aircraft was to fly supersonic without afterburner, impossible to do without with the bombs suspended below or so what they do is they carry the armament inside and close it. It is like retractable landing gear, your retractable armament. Okay, so, but that is very complicated and only sustained and justified if you have such special requirements. Okay, what else? Anything else projecting outwards? 
So look, you are struggling to find the answer which is correct because we do not want things to protect outside. Aerodynamicists are always interested in managing with least amount of protuberances. Some will be required like phytostatic tube etc. from behind. Those are lightning, lightning discharge strips and then sometimes there are flap tracks below. Below the wing there are you, unfortunately when you have huge heavy flaps which take lots of load, you have to use electrical motors to deflect them down. So they have a flap track and that track is aerodynamically smoothened by these things. So they look very awkward but that is the best you can do. Without that you cannot have flaps which can take so much load and also bend so much down. So all these protuberances are going to create additional drag. We try to minimize them. Now some aircraft will have more protuberances by function because they are doing something which needs it. For example, if I ask you a question, a strategic bomber and a tactical bomber, which will have more protuberances? A tactical bomber because it will have so many things which are to be, it is a low speed aircraft. Uh, strategic bomber is generally long distance flying at higher altitude. You do not need to have so many things projecting out. So by nature, bombers are messy, they have all these protuberances and uh, transports are very smooth, they have less protuberances. But nevertheless, they will still have some protuberances. Okay, let us go ahead. So then, yeah, leakage. Okay, I forgot to mention. Very good. Thanks for pointing out. Oh, what is meant by leakage? Where do you have leakages in aircraft? Exhaust. Exhaust, yes. Exhaust is a leakage. So, any place where the ambient air is either sucked in or expelled for a functional reason. Not because of bad design, there is a crack or there is a gap between two panels and the air is going in. That is an undesirable leakage. So where will you have this kind of a thing in an aircraft and why will you have it? Engines are designed to take in air, so they will have. But this is not that engine leakage. Oxygen, so, so do you suck it from atmosphere? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. We take it. So the pressurization system and the air conditioning system has some inlet ducts. You are right, they have some inlet ducts. They make it very nice and smooth. They are like small intakes which are at many places. So what happens is when the ambient air hits that, there is a momentum loss. It comes to a almost a standstill or a very low speed. That creates drag. Okay. Any other place? Cooling of avionics or cooling of, now many people say do cooling by bleeding the air from the engine, but it is still hot. One easy way of cooling will be take ambient air inside. Uh, you look at typical engine, they have cooling intakes, they are air cooled engines. So when you have air cooling engine ducts, you are collecting ambient air, you are bringing it to a stop or a low velocity, it will create. So that is, so the leakage is both inflow and outflow of air from any component on the aircraft which is required for a function that is leakage except the engine, engine is a different thing and then you have protuberances. So because of this there will be additional drag, we just call it as a LNP drag. As I mentioned if you look at the rear view of the aircraft, the base, so area that you see from the back view on the fuselage, if it is a large number, that is the base area. So this is a very simple formula for the component built up method. So for each component, you calculate first the CF for that component. CF is the equivalent skill friction coefficient for that component. I will show you how to do it. Then you multiply it by form factor for that component, which is also a procedure. You multiply it by the interference factor for the component, which is also a procedure into the s ret of that component divided by the s ref of that component. Now uh, be very careful, this s ref is only and only aircraft reference area. That is why it is taken common in denominator. This is not the area of the component. This s ref is the area, reference area of the aircraft which is the planform area. Okay. Now you might say, what is the physics doing here? How are we relating? the wetted area of a nacelle with the area of the wing or platform. So this is not physics, 
this was a procedure. Okay. If you and me both understand the procedure, we will not make a mistake. Mistakes happen when you assume something and I assume something. So by convention, SREF is the aircraft reference area and all other terms are component specific. So you sum them up and then you add a component because of miscellaneous items, flaps, windshield, etc., air brake, etc., 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 and then you add a factor for leakage and protuberances. And this particular slide gives all the description of all the elements so that when you look at it back home, do not make the mistake of looking at this slide only in the examination and forgetting about it from now on. Many people do it. Oh, he gives the notes and it is open notes, so we will see it there. You will be doing something there, nonsensical and you will get wrong answers. Okay. So you have to practice this thing. You have to do it for your aircraft, get the number, check it with the published data. If there is a mistake, come and meet me and say there is a lot of mismatch. I am getting 20 percent higher. Maybe I can give you some hints on what, what has gone wrong somewhere. All right. Now let us see this CF is the skin friction coefficient for each component. Now, <clears throat> how, what does it depend on? It depends on three important parameters. It depends on the Reynolds number. It depends on the Mach number. It depends on the skin roughness. After all, what is the purpose of this skin roughness coefficient? So if it is a smooth surface, this is a rough surface, this is a smooth surface, air flowing over my hand will have less drag than air flowing over this one. Because the mean height of the uh, surface is less here and more here. This is a rough surface. If I put a sandpaper, it will become further rough. So therefore, depending on the surface roughness, we should have more or less drag. So that is a factor. Reynolds number and Mach number also affect the skin, the value of CF. Now, it is also a very strong function of the flow nature, whether the flow is laminar or turbulent. This is where the contribution of aerodynamics come. This is where Dr. Kota made a lecture. He told, we are attempting to bring in laminar flow on the aircraft by making aerodynamic modifications. Why? Because it's, it gives a phenomenal advantage. Now, for your information, <coughs> in the aircraft technology, Reynolds numbers are always mentioned in millions. 10 to the power 6, half million, 1 million. So what is the typical Reynolds number of aircraft with which you are dealing? What do you think? So raising L by mu will be how much for your aircraft? It will be between around 6 million for very small aircraft like Cessna 172 to maybe 8 or 10 million okay, for big large aircraft or high speed aircraft. So you will not go normally beyond 10 million and not below around 2 or 3 million. That is the range. If you have more than half million, problems are already started. It is almost Im not impossible but very difficult to maintain laminar flow. You can but very difficult. You have to struggle a lot to maintain laminar flow. That is inherent in the nature of flow. So lower than now for which kind of aircraft? Can you have half million Reynolds number? No, I told you now for your aircraft in the classroom, everything will be above 2 or 3 million. Glider also, do not go by the speed, size is large. So that makes drones, UAVs, small planes, RC planes that you make, they will have 30,000, 40,000, half a million Reynolds number. So on them you can have laminar flow. But the problem is if a student like you says, okay, I have learned aircraft design, I have read it from Raymer, Ruscom, Nievo, and you make a UAV and you start sizing it and start analyzing it based on those formulae, you will go completely haywire because your Reynolds numbers are half million three hundred thousand and these formulae are meant for more than four or five million. So that is why you will always have wrong answers. Now the advantage is this, at a Reynolds number of 1 million just as a benchmark, the turbulent skin friction drag is 3 times more than laminar. So if I make it laminar, okay, 
Let's say I have a small aircraft or a low speed aircraft and I am flying at a number of 1 million and somehow I make it fly in laminar flow, immediately I have reduced drag by one third. Which drag? Only the skin friction drag. Because for turbulent flow, the same aircraft will have three times higher skin friction drag coefficient as compared to laminar. This is the reason why many people try and invest their energy in making the flow to maintain laminar for long. Now, how do you achieve it? Only possible by using very smooth skin, maybe by using a molded composite or polishing the metal. In X1 aircraft, they used to polish the aircraft after every flight with sandpaper and buffer it so that the surface becomes polished, very smooth. But it's difficult to do that for every aircraft. You cannot say the patients, are, the passengers are waiting, aircraft is being polished. Only then it will take off. You cannot do that. Correct? It's very expensive and it is impractical. So, if you do all this you will still be able to get laminar flow only on around one-fifth of the wing and on the fuselage, forget it. Extremely difficult to get unless you do special measures. Okay. So, the, the story is just to communicate to you is very difficult. So, it is better to assume turbulent flow and be practical about your aircraft unless, unless you come up with a very special aircraft. So, this particular graph is a very useful graph because it gives you the value of CF which you need for each component as a function of Reynolds number and Mach number. So, if you are able to make it laminar, use the bottom line, the blue line which is one third below and if you are not able to do it, then you use the line among the top three or four lines where there is uh, different line for different <laughs> Reynolds number. So, half million, 1 million, 1.25 million and you can project it further for higher Reynolds numbers okay? or you can try to get this graph from literature for higher Reynolds numbers. So, what do we see here? As you go from left to right, the Reynolds number is increasing and we see that for Reynolds number between 0.2 million to say point to around 1 million, there can be a steep drop in the skin friction coefficient with Reynolds number. After that, it is dropping but it is flattening now, it is flattening. So, as you increase Reynolds number, the skin friction drag reduces. So, it is good to flat higher high Reynolds number because induced drag, the pressure drag will be less. But the rate of change is much larger in the beginning and then it starts flattening out. Also, reverse also is true. For some condition, if the Reynolds number is reduced, what happens to the CF? CF goes up. On the y axis, you can see, na? as Reynolds number is reducing, CF is going up. Okay. So, remember this because we will use it now. Now, here is an example of one of our friendly aircraft. We have seen this aircraft in the past also. This is one aircraft where tremendous effort has been attempted in making laminar flow over the fuselage, over the wing, over the tail. With all that effort, only half the wing has laminar flow and one third of the fuselage has laminar flow. But because of that, even though it is turboprop, it is able to fly at a speed of 400 knots. So, turboprop efficiency at jet performance. <coughs> if you remember the film that we saw, it said that the Avanti has no competition in turboprops. The nearest competition is the Citation jet. So, turboprop efficiency, turboprop cost, but jet performance. How? By making tremendous efforts to maintain laminar flow, shaping the fuselage itself like an aerofoil, using a tractor propeller so that the wing is not disturbed with the flow of the propeller. Okay. But with that also you can get only half the wing and one third of the fuselage. Now do you remember what, now this aircraft, do you remember what is the material used to construct it? Aluminium. But uh, composites etc are giving better shape better uh, aerodynamic smoothness. So, if you build with metal, 
then you must take special precautions. So what was done in this aircraft? It is a metallic aircraft, but what was done while constructing this aircraft to ensure that the surface is smooth? It was built from inside rather than from outside. Normally what you do is you put two skins and then you rivet it from outside. So if you know how aircraft is produced, the components are made and then you join them from outside. In this case, it is the other way around. They built it from inside because they wanted to avoid any kind of projections along. So read about it aircraft. See the film once again. It is available on YouTube. You should know these things because these are attempts made by designers to do special things. With all that, unfortunately, it is a commercial failure. It did not really succeed that much because it was probably beyond its time and probably because certain other aircraft were made available which were able to do the same thing. So that is a different matter, but technically it is a marvelous aircraft. Okay. So now uh, we will very quickly see how do you model the effect of surface roughness, which is one of the major contribution of skin friction drag. So we do that by, now we know that roughness leads to higher CF, that is a understandable thing. As I said, more drag here, less drag here and lesser here because of the surface roughness. But how do you take care? Now you are doing conceptual design. What do you, will you go and measure the roughness of the surface? How do you take care of that? Yeah. So let us say you are using some material, we have the idea about roughness. But how do you incorporate that in the calculation? So I will tell you what is done. There is a very interesting concept called as a cutoff Reynolds number. Okay. That is what is used. So what you do is, to model the effect of skin roughness, we use a concept of cut off Reynolds number. What is this? So what you do is, <clears throat> you first calculate the cut off Reynolds number defined by these two formulae for aircraft flying at Mach number below 0.75, RE cut off is 3821 times L by K to the power 1.053. So L is the characteristic length. What will that be for the fuselage? diameter, max diameter. What about uh, aircraft? Wing? What will be the length for the wing? It will be the wing aerodynamic cord, MAC. The, what, do you ever remember wing aerodynamic cord? Okay, there is a formula to calculate that based on taper and all that. So, mean aerodynamic cord is the characteristic length for wing, horizontal tail, vertical tail. And max diameter is the characteristic length for fuselage and nacelles. You will only encounter these five things mostly. So you calculate L by K. Now what is K? K is the mean, mean skin roughness. Okay. So here is a table which gives you the value of K in millimeters. So now notice which one has the smallest value of K? Smooth composite, okay, composite obviously that will have the lowest one because it is very smooth and the average thickness. Now how do you measure the mean, how do you measure K actually? So you, you know, take a microscope and go, even if you look at a composite, if you zoom, 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 you will find some up and down. So find the mean height of the projections. It will be 0 0.0052 millimeters, very small. Interesting observation is that there is something called as a production sheet metal which has a lower one than smooth paint and the worst is the camouflage paint. So what is camouflage paint? Yeah, so nowadays it is a very big fashion statement. Many people wear camouflage dresses also, right? <coughs> you see them in shirts and in pants also. So basically it is the military fatigues, there is a brown and green combinations, patches to disguise the aircraft when it is parked. So if it is, if it is a, an aircraft like, um, let us take an example, like MiG-21, which um, BIS, which is supposed to be air to ground fighter, it will be blue paint with dark blue patches like a cloud. So it gives a cloud camouflage. If it is MiG-27, which is a ground based fighter, it will have green and brown fatigue. So how do you do that? You put extra paint on that and then you have to leave patches. It creates more dry. But it is required by a function. So you do it knowing very well that it is going to give you more drag. 
Now, have you seen some low cost airlines which do not paint the aircraft? There are some. We do not paint the aircraft. They save money on paint. They save money on labor. They save money on weight. You will be surprised on a 737, it is 90 kilograms weight of the paint of the aircraft. That means one passenger. One passenger means money. Okay. So, they save money on the cost of paint, cost of painting, weight of the paint and there is less dry also because production sheet metal has a lower value than painted one. Okay. So, what you do is you calculate this number first. If this number is lower than the actual renounce number, use this in the calculation and we know that a lower renounce number means higher dry. So, effect of skin roughness is incorporated by using a lower renounce number than actual if it, that number is lower than the actual renounce number. So, whichever is lower, you use that in the calculation. Now, if the cutoff renounce number is higher than your actual renounce number, then do not use the cutoff one, whichever is minimum. Laminar flow is almost not possible. I have tried to emphasize it so much, by now you should give up on that. It is very difficult to do it in an actual aircraft because the moment you put paints, you put um, pitot tube, you put um, rivets, and nose redome, etc., it won't remain, it will trip. So, if you are uh, designing something like Avanti, then you have to use special formulae, maybe, then you will say no, we will use it to be laminar. But in general, I would ask you to assume total turbulent flow on the aircraft. On the wings, if you are very particular, you can take 10 15 percent. More than that is difficult to maintain. Finally, we have form factors, factors, and also one more called interference factors. Okay, so form factor, there is one formula given for wing-like bodies, wing, vertical tail, horizontal tail. So it uses x by c, m, and t by c, and Mach number and lambda m, four parameters. X by c only the maximum. X by c, x by c, m is the location of the maximum thickness. This is available for some. So, for some aircraft, you might say the aircraft uses NACA 4412 aerofoil. The wing uses that. So, what is the location S by C? M. NACA 4412. So, NACA 4412, the first 4 stands for what? Think about it. You have forgotten everything. You have, you have done this. I learned this thing in my BTEC, which was what? 79 to 83. Okay, I do not know how many of you were born before that or during that time. I still remember it. Okay, that is the way I teach every year. <laughs> that is why I remember it. I do not remember otherwise. <laughs> so, the last two digits are the maximum thickness to chord ratio. The first four is correct, maximum camber in hundreds of the chord, and the second four is the location of the maximum thickness in tens which is 0.4. So, you will take x by c as 0.4 for uh, for uh, anaka 4412. Otherwise, you take it 0.3 or 0.5 that is a hint available to you. I am talking no, but uh, there is one parameter which talks about the thickness value, the other it talks about the location of the maximum thickness. <coughs> one of them is that chamber percentage, the other is location of maximum thickness, the third is location of the uh, value of thickness. So, take it 0.3 or 0 0.5 okay? and then lambda m is the sweep of the maximum thickness line. This also either you can get from the data or you can do it for 0 0.3 line or 0 0.4 line depending on the aircraft type. So, Mach number you know, lambda m and x by c and t by c you can get from the geometry. So, you should be able to use this formula. If you have a body like a fuselage, you do not have cord there, you do not have x by c or t by c there. So, there you have what is called as a cylindricity. Okay. So, there is a parameter called small f which is 1 upon root 4 pi by a max. A max is the max cross sectional area and this f is giving you how much it is away from a circle basically. That is the condition. So, calculate f using a max area cross section and then get ff as 1 plus 60 by fq plus f by 400. This is an empirical formula. 
and finally for something like a nacelle or a store or a bomb or armament we can use simply 1 plus 0.35 in by f which is f is l over d length over diameter length of the drop tank or the nacelle or the store upon the diameter so l by d is used there so there are these three formulae which can be used for different components depending on what they are remember that the form factor helps us to take care of the pressure drive because of viscous separation and also remember that these formulae are not to be used for all Mach numbers, only up to the drag divergence Mach number. But beyond that you have so many other things happening, you cannot, you cannot assume the flow to be mostly attached if MDD is more than 1, if, if you are N is more than MDD. Okay. So do not use this formulae for all Mach numbers use them only up to the drag divergence Mach number. Okay. Lastly, we have the interference factor Q, which is as I said telling you about the effect of interference. So, it takes care of the fact that if you have a store which is mounted near the fuselage, it has got more value of interference, so typical value. Now, fuselage is the baseline component. So, the interference of fuselage on itself will be nothing. So that is why it is 1. So here are some numbers for a butterfly tail, a V tail, conventional tail and if it is just tells you that if you have a conventional tail, because of the tail there is a 5 percent additional interference. And because in V tail you remove one member, you have only two members now, you have 3 percent additional drag. That is all it is being conveyed here. Okay. Then, yes, okay. So, I mentioned to you that for nacelle and for any external store, it is a function of the distance. If you make the distance L equal to 0, that means you are mounting it on the body, that is 50 percent interference. This is too bad. Never do this. Never mount any store or drop tank attached to the fuselage. Always keep it little bit away. If you keep it up to up to 1 diameter away, there is 30 percent interference. If you keep it more than 1 diameter away, no interference. Okay? And uh, the cue for victim missiles is basically between wing and the missile. It is not fuselage and the missile, it is wing and the missile. Similarly, wing location, high wing, mid wing, low wing. So, all of you have different aircraft with different wing configurations. If you have a high wing or a mid wing, or if you have a nice filleting, then no interference, it can be assumed to be 0. But if you have a low wing which is unfilleted or a high wing also with very bad filleting, which will not happen actually, you will have very high drag. Now for LNP, we simply take a percentage, that is all. We cannot do anything more than this. So we just say, okay, if it is a dirty aircraft, it will have uh, some percentage. If it is uh, less, it will have lower percentage. Now, for miscellaneous drag, we must define a concept called a drag area. Now, what do you mean by drag area? Drag is basically a force, right? So, drag area is just a concept. It is a by definition, drag area is a multiplication. It is a multiplication between the drag coefficient of that body and area. Pd into S for any body is its drag area. So, now D is QSCD by definition. Q is half rho V square dynamic pressure. So, if you divide D by Q, you will get the same thing SCD. And what are the units of S into CD? CD is dimensionless. S is meter square. That is why it is called a drag area. Okay. And <coughs> S is normally S reference. So, for any miscellaneous body like an antenna projecting out, or for anything that you carry, for example, air to air refueling probe, how do you get the drag of that? So, the manufacturer will give you its drag area or there will be some graphs available for drag area. From there you can calculate. So, it is an indication. Now, you will see this very common in automobile and all that. So, you know some of you uh, are keen in motorcycles, automobile, etc. I will give you some numbers which is very interesting. A typical cycle has a drag area of 0.6 or 0.7 square meters, but in their case there is no wing, so there is no reference area, it is actually frontal area. Okay. 
Now look at some cars. The first one is a Volkswagen XL1. Do you see something very peculiar in this car? The back wheels are covered. I have not seen such car where the back wheels are covered. The purpose is to reduce the interference drag. Okay. So the drag area is only 0.279. And look at the worst one, Hummer on the bottom, huge car with almost vertical surfaces, vertical windscreen, vertical grill. Drag area is 10 times more. So it's 2.46. So. <coughs> In between is a Honda inside which is much more smoother etc. So uh, I have a student who works in Mercedes Benz R&D center doing CFD on cars. So he keeps calculating drag area for uh, Honda this, Honda that and you know they start comparing and then they say this will affect the fuel consumption, flow of raindrops on the mirror, on the, on the glass when it is raining, wiper dynamics, all that is calculated and then you calculate the drag area of the cars. So this helps in the reduction of the drag of the car. In high speed car, it is a big difference. And many of these racer cars, the drag area is the main driving criteria so that they can accelerate much faster in the races. So, <clears throat> similarly, coming back to aircraft, for stores, for any armament, etc., you get data for drag area versus uh, Mach number. Okay, I will quickly finish a couple of things. Uh, what is the time? I think we are almost out of time today. Yeah, so I think we'll stop here. Then we'll we'll see this miscellaneous drag when we meet next time. Now Friday is a holiday, I believe, so we meet again on next Wednesday.